不舍的你手指。I'm here to provide you. Suddenly, sound tracks will show you you care. Oh, be more. The soundtrack inside you would sweet understanding. Oh, with sweet understanding, with sweet understanding, soundtracks are your friend. Welcome to Suddenly Soundtracks, the show where we judge a movie solely based on the soundtrack that it provides. And here, for spooky season, we're going to do shock treatment with three very special guests. William Bibiani, Video Drew, and Mark Edward Hoyk. And huge shout out to our gold tier associate producer, Brandy Parker, and ruby tier producers, Brandon Buckingham. Kale, the youth critic, Stephen Wright, Ferris Muthana, Michael K, Bedour, and Molly Damon. You patrons rock, and everybody who supported us and supports us and continues to do so does as well. All right, guys, we're gonna get right into the show itself. As you know, if you've been on the, if you've seen the show before, we go through a song, the the track list, track by track, and each panelist judges the song solely based on the soundtrack that it provides. There is uh, there is six scores. All right, uh, six out of five is a hard rockin'. Five out of five is a rockin'. A four out of five is a download it. A three out of five is a shuffle it. A two out of five is a one-time listen. And a one out of five is a skip it. And each panelist only gets two hard rockins. Bada bing. Bada boom. Is everybody all good? We're going to get right into this with track number one, Denton USA. And Bibbs, I'm going to let you start off. What are your thoughts on the song Denton USA and how it starts off shock? Well, I mean, the, the actual first track is an orchestral uh, bit that just sort of gives you like a hint of everything that's mm -hmm. to come. But once Denton starts hitting, yeah. and Denton is the theme song of Denton, USA. That's the hometown where Brad and Janet were from in Rocky Horror. Mm -hmm. And much as at the beginning of Rocky Horror, we established that they come from the most like banal, wholesome, repressed, probably secretly awful white American suburb imaginable. Mm -hmm. That was all implied by that wedding sequence here. We're hearing the people who are proud of how shallow they are and of how, uh, um, when they refer to the fact that they're not racists, they find the most racist way to say that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's, it's really, a, it's a catchy, charming, enthusiastic anthem, especially when the cheerleaders start coming in and making it seem like a pep rally for everyone at Denton, USA. But it's wonderfully subversive and it's wonderfully bitter and cynical about uh, this place that is going to be sent up wildly over the course of the soundtrack slash film. So I'm really rather fond of it. Yeah, it comes off as like a, a kind of Beach Boys kind of vibe too musically. It has yeah. a very, very kind of like surfing USA kind of vibe to it that I really did. Uh, Drew, what are your thoughts on Denton USA? Well, I think that's it. I think you're exactly right. I think of uh, Bibzan and, and what you just said, Chris, because there's certainly a, a Beach Boys element, may I say like a, a, a Juicy Fruits sort of element to the song. Like it, it does feel like a song that you'd find in Phantom of the Paradise. Like it is just that kind of like biting, sort of withering, uh, but at the same time, like totally a bop. Mm -hmm. number that like social commentary wrapped in a like a very clever like like teeny bopper like sound which so i really like it yeah it's a, i dig it uh mark what are your thoughts on the intro 
Oh, well, yeah, that it's it, it is very good at just sending up small town values under this you know, thin cover of looking positive where they're showing their ass and not even realizing it. And uh, I have been to uh, several uh, shock treatment screenings and there are there, there, there isn't like an organized callback. Uh, list the way there is for Rocky Horror, but there are people who have seen it enough times that they have their own uh, callbacks on it. And, uh, you know, the very, right out of the gate when they're singing, you'll find happy hearts and friendly faces, tolerance of the ethnic races, and everyone in the audience yells, except Mexicans <laughs> in Denver. Oh. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so on the nose. So and that's the thing that's frustrating about something like shock treatment is that it's it's send up of conservative values are still frustratingly relevant. And this song, which is basically like I, I you, you watch like the vice presidential debates last night and everything Mike Pence was saying about, you know, conservative American values and how we need to protect the suburbs and everything. And you realize that it's the same line and it has not evolved and it is just as hypocritical and it's just as really um, underhandedly cruel in a lot of ways. Uh, and I think this song captures all of that while being very, very fun. And that's hard to do. It's hard to have a song that clearly has this much anger and social critique in it while still being chipper and charming and mm -hmm. bless it. This song does it. It's amazing. And it, it's also very good at uh, ever so slightly establishing the character traits of each individual person mm -hmm. who is saying it, you know, that they're, that they're all these yeah. very shallow people, but you're getting the specific manner in which facet of their personal interest rules their life. Right. Yeah. I almost like yeah. I almost think shock treatment has a disservice done to it by not being a limited edition series of, yeah. on television today. Like, <laughs> I think it make a really good like it would make a really good again like a very good Ryan Murphy esque production or just sort of like these different yeah. sort of warring factions, these different interests. It's very Hollywood. It's yeah. very Nurse Ratchet, the unnecessary Nurse Ratchet. Like it's it's very much like yeah. of that sphere where you're like getting you're getting to know these shallow people very deeply. Yeah, hundred and ten. And this is the thing that's really—I think it's—I think the movie really fails the soundtrack in this regard because we're getting to know all of these people, but the way that the movie presents it is as a performance on television. But the majority of the characters who are singing it are not supposed to be the people on TV. And you can imagine the original version of this song. This was supposed to just be guiding you through the entire town of Denton as we met all of these characters just singing incidentally about their lives in this sort of Oklahoma, oh, what a beautiful morning way. And the way that it works in the, in the film is less effective than just hearing the song. Well, I would disagree with that. Because uh, it, w it was only five years before Shock Treatment that we had Network. And one of uh, Howard Beale's rants is the fact that we eat the tube, we sleep the tube, we live in the tube. And in a sense, these are people who live entirely in the tube. So even though it is a save staging-wise, I think it fits the tone of the movie in that you know, these are people who are thinking all about image. And, you know, even if you didn't have the TV framework, they're thinking about, oh, what will the neighbors think? You know, right. what will the, the right. HOA think? So that's only one step removed from what will a TV audience think? Right. No, I, I agree with you. They're yeah. aware of they're they're aware of the main stage, but they kind of act as if at any given time a camera yeah. might be on them. Like they almost like know that there's cameras in their home. They don't know mm -hmm. necessarily, mm -hmm. you know, sense like that they know uh, whose home is being programmed at any given time. So just yeah, it gives that kind of weird Big Brother sense that they're all just play acting all the time. I, that weird. Well, I, I think that's yeah. No, I agree. I think that's part of it is that the idea is that the people are watching so much TV that their lives are emulating what they see. I get that that's all in there. And Mark, I agree with you that the, this save, this concept that it's all taking place within a studio um, and it's sort of reality and fiction and reality TV are sort of becoming, you know, almost indistinguishable from one another. All of that is kind of interesting on the page. What I would argue is that what they sacrifice for all of that literalization of their sort of 
broad, far reaching themes is narrative clarity. And I think that this song has narrative clarity that the movie does not. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Richard O'Brien doesn't really like, I feel like, care that much about sacrificing narrative clarity for any given tracking shot. There's that great opening, Mm -hmm. like, just sort of that cranial shot of the whole studio kind of going around. You're like, that's a very good shot. And you're like, and it kind of ruins the contract of the song, but it's a very good shot. Yeah, I also feel like yeah. well, that Richard O'Brien though, that's Jim Sharman. Yeah, yeah that's the, he's the actual yeah. director of the film, and you know, we, yeah, he's the guy who always kind of gets lost in the Rocky discourse. But you know, sure. he did both movies, and before that, he had a decent like stage and film career in Australia. So yeah, it's he's. He, he doesn't get enough credit for his contributions. Absolutely, he does not. I, I agree. I also feel. Yeah, like- and I think the one thing that you know, with, it's because Rocky did, isn't thought of as, as something that's like a narrative structure. It's more thought of as like a, a phenomenon that you go through, mm-hmm. or it's like a point in time in your life. You don't really think about it like uh, you, you, the songs. I think are easier to break apart, and the performances are, are than to like think of the whole construct of what Rocky Hart was trying to say, like what world it was trying to build. Mm-hmm. To like, you know, and because this is like an extenuation of that world or it's a whole new world with like the same characters who are living alternate realities. Like it's it's mm. kind of like half half birth reality in this movie that we well, are all, seeing. It's also one of the you're right. It's one of those weird films where the auteur is not considered to be the director. And I think that's because Charmin's directing style, especially in Rocky Horror, um, isn't especially flashy. In fact, he's actually trying to get out of the way of the music and, uh, you know, the, the farce. And even though he's obviously paying homage to a lot of classical films, old dark house, et cetera, scare films, um, they're just not, there's a, there's an inherent staginess to it that doesn't call attention to the director and lets you pay all the attention to the actors and the music. And I think that's less the case here in shock treatment. And I think Charmin is, a uh, uh, absolutely 100%, uh, uh, guiding the film more. And I think in large mm-hmm. part because they had to conceptually alter what shock treatment would be into yes. something that was a bit more um, surreal and cinematic. Yeah. Well, it's so I- interesting to learn that like, it, to learn that this all took place like over these like weird, like, you know, uh, constrictions, you know, like this is like constraints or yeah. whatever, like yeah. had to like basically, yeah, there, shoot it within these constraints. There was a lot of constraints, yeah. especially this, this opening number. I feel like should have, probably been outdoors and in, in introducing you yeah. to the Denton itself. Instead, it's all stuck in studio, yeah. but I, I, that's all due. You to can the, imagine yeah. like the camera, like panning yeah. over the football field at the high yeah. school. And that's when the cheerleaders yeah. come in and, yeah. uh, yeah. and would have been so great. But, but, uh, but you know what? That has nothing to do with the score itself. In my opinion, it, it, right. it basically, sure. it essentially gives you what the mood is of the, the show. It gives you exactly what you need. It's really rock and catchy. I give it a rock and it does its job. It, it's five out of five for me. Uh, Mark, what would you give it? I get, I give it a four out of five. Okay. I think it is one of it. It, it definitely works by itself mm-hmm. outside of the movie that you don't need a context. If you heard it in shuffle that you would think, Oh, this is just an indictment of small town life that you, you, you would have gotten on, you know, a, like a zap, a concept album or something similar. 110%. Mm-hmm. Uh, Drew. Right. Right. It, it definitely mm-hmm. had a concept album feel to it. I could see that. Uh, Drew, what do you give it? You know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna blow this early because I don't think there's that many uh, songs that I'm just I'm just drawn to that intensely in okay. this soundtrack. So I, I'm gonna give this one one of my one of my rare sixes, one of my two sixes, because okay. it is such a bop. I, I mean, re-listening to it, this is the one that I walked away from being like, oh yeah, this is like such a little it, it is, it is headbanger. Fun. It's fun. Uh, Bibbs, what, what do you give it, bud? Uh, well, first, I just want to say one thing regarding, um, you know, whether or not that has anything to do with uh, the movie, because I feel like when you're listening to the soundtrack, you get a different sense of the yeah. song than you do with the movie. And the sense that I get is of this big, expansive introduction to a whole town thing. So I think the song is is just better on the soundtrack. I think it is a great soundtrack song. I agree with Mark. This is a great introduction to what South Treatment will be. Um, I would give so many songs in the soundtrack a six if you let me. But I'm gonna not blow it all the way because I've decided to reserve it for my two favorites. So this is a rocket. Perfect. That's but right. this is a this may be only be a rocket, but this is a hard it's just rocket. It's just a hard, it's a hard rocket. Yeah, yeah, it's a hard rocket, but it's not a hard rocket. Hundred and ten percent. We're gonna get into something that's yeah. an earworm, and I think it's the biggest earworm on the soundtrack. <laughs> it's bitching in the kitchen. <laughs> Why are we always sooner or later? 
Smashing in the kitchen or crying in the bedroom all night. Living on a night, Gosh, guys, I don't know what to say, except that again, in my hazy recollection of what this movie is like I again thought it was maybe something I had come up with in a fever dream but this was the song that I've walked away being like I definitely made this up in a dream somewhere where the lyrics are like I was bitching in the kitchen or crying in the bedroom all night and they're just singing like ooh percolator like why can't it be sooner or later like they're just talking to random objects and, and like it's like literally I guess like the the hook I imagine was Richard O'Brien just like one day being like I wonder if I can make anything wrong with percolator uh let me try let me try something <laughs> Like it's it's really funny. It's like a sincerely ridiculous song that again reminds me of Phantom of the Paradise. Reminds me of Rocky. But I think again, I don't know why Phantom is coming up more than I, more than Rocky for me. Maybe there's it's a, just I think, Paul Williams well, element. Well, Jessica something. Harper's in it. She's she's. Oh, Jessica Harper's in it. That's she's true. Jessica Harper. She's yeah. Phoenix. Uh, Jessica. Well, there's also there's also like I think I think Phantom has a bit more of an indictment of a certain kind of capitalism yeah uh, in that case it's of the entertainment industry like in terms of like the music industry and how it choose people right. spits them out and I think uh, uh, shock treatment is more about how it induces people to group think and mindless consumerism mm-hmm. uh, but there, I think I think there is definitely I think it'd be a good double feature I think it's I'd love to see a double feature over the course of those two double features I think it's like her turning from yeah. like good home, yeah. hometown girl into like this weird glitterati monster beast it's a good kind yeah, of trilogy happens twice. if you want to make it a trilogy yeah. of them and Latin Rocky Horror I think all three of them have that kind of quality yeah. to it uh a bibs, bibs yeah. bitching in the kitchen. Is it bitching? Uh, it's the it's the bitchinest. Uh, <laughs> I love this song. This song is again uh, one of the things I love most about Richard O'Brien's music is his incredible ability to be verbose mm-hmm. without it getting in the way of anything, and his rhyme structures are often just maddeningly brilliant. And I think this song in particular is the cream of the crop in this soundtrack. Because in addition to just having the most wonderful uh, concoctions of uh, of suburban desperation and also just stuff you want to buy, um, I think I feel like this is kind of the film in a, in a nutshell. Here, this is the the premise in a microcosm: is that you know Brad and Janet they got married, and whether or not Rocky Horror happened or didn't happen in this universe, mm-hmm. by now they've settled in. They're just living together and. What they have found is that this belief that your life will be fulfilled or or will feel whole if you just buy stuff and they're looking at all of this stuff that they have or that they want Mm -hmm. and asking it, please, knife drawer, won't you help me to face life more? But you're not doing that, are you? And all I am doing is bitching in the kitchen or crying in the bedroom. And that's it. Those are the only two states of being I have at home. And on top of that, (laughs) it's fun and catchy and delightful. This is Easily one of my two favorite songs in the soundtrack. I think the song is brilliant in and out of context. A hundred percent. I actually wish on the soundtrack we didn't have the narrator in the background. I kind of wish that musically we kind of could have heard it more because I think it had a... Mm. I don't know if you guys think that way, but I think the narrator in the background <laughs> kind of is a little distracting. Um, no. I've gotten used to it after listening yeah. to it for 20 years. I, I totally get it. Or 30 uh, now, I guess. Uh, uh, I, 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 I think that, again... You know, in the whole sort of concept album idea I put forth earlier, you, you kind of need it there, although it would be great to have a bonus track with just the song itself. Yeah. yeah. It's a uh, song that me and my and, friends like, uh, in high school would like take drugs and like sing this song. This was like the one that I remember like singing. <laughs> so, like, I don't, like, I'm not saying I have a really cool group of friends, but I totally did. And, uh, yeah, this is, this was song was hilarious to us. Even with, you know, and we were very big into, like, the whole rebellious high school thing because I, I grew up in a planned community in Maryland that was created by the guy who created the world's first shopping mall. It's also Edward Norton's grandfather. Oh. It's a really weird, like, small, oh. uh, yeah, planned community called Columbia, Maryland. So, like, when I saw this movie, like, it was after having moved to, for, like, to a different place for high school that was very much a weirdly cult-ish, very, like, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, Stepford Wives kind of element that I was like noticing as mm-hmm. being strange after coming from the suburbs of like a place that didn't have like that had normal urban sprawl. So I remember this song like hitting in a very like deep, dark way that I was like, there's something to this. It's very real because uh, our town was created by like the concept of a shopping mall. Yeah, um, that totally well said. Um, what I'm going to go through is, uh, Drew, what do you give it? I'm going to give this one, I, you know, I know this isn't like the greatest uh, 
strategy, but I'm going to give this one my other six. This is just such a good box. Oh, right story. off the bat. Okay. Yeah. All right. Six, six. Um, Mark. Um, I'm only going to give this one a three. Whoa. And okay. the, reason, the reason being is that I respect the all the structure of you know the way it's done with the commercial announcer and uh the the lyrics and the juxtaposition of you know material goods and emotional restraint or uh, uh discontent but it kind of for me it wears out its welcome after like the first verse it's like uh, okay, I get it. It's going to be a bunch of fucking puns about kitchen appliances. So, <laughs> all right, we get it. Let's move on. I got you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Bibbs. Uh, one second. I'm trying to figure out how to mute Mark forever. Right. How do I do this? I'm new with the technology. Uh, no, I, I disagree with Mark. I, I'm totally on Drew's, uh, on Drew's wavelength here. I also give this a hard rocking. Yeah, I actually give uh, it. And I, I think it's... Int- yeah, I'm sorry. I think it's interesting what Mark said because he said like, okay, this is going to be a whole lot of puns about like consumer products and suburban desperation, and I'm like, that's what I asked for. That's what I wanted. That's you're you're offering me gold here, and you're, you're mad that it's not aluminum. Like that's I don't understand it. So for me, this is everything like I want in like a Richard O'Brien song. This is everything I want in this kind of. Uh, quirky musical number and yeah this is a hard rock and easily one of the for me if i really 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 gunned to my head had to pick the two best songs on the soundtrack this is up there but there's a couple that are that are in high competition as well i'll admit it but yeah this is hard rock It's it's very uncanny uh-huh. because uh, Drew has been talking about you know, how she relates the movie to Phantom of the Paradise, and this song f- fulfills almost the exact same purpose yeah. that uh, Special to Me does in Phantom, where it's mm-hmm. the first real showcase for Jessica Harper, and she just you know bat you know bats it out of the park, you know that it's. It, 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 that I feel like it, it it really works at, and it's not just because it's clever. You know that it feels like a real you know song, emotional expression, and it's so uncanny how it mirrors uh, special to me. Even in how there's that little aside in that uh, special to me has that little where she goes off octaves, like where we go once we arrive, and and in uh, in my own way is. It has that little has that little change of octave break and you all you can see babe you want it to be babe and so it, it feels almost as if he was copying uh special to me when he wrote this that that this one this is uh, i think one of my favorite uh songs on the record because it I think it just really works as a song. It still c- gets the story of where their relationship is going at that time. And it, but it, it doesn't, uh, it, it feels, it has a sincerity to it that I think some of the other songs lack. It, it really was. It really just sounds like, and, and it really fit her. I'm wondering if they wrote this for her. For, or did yeah, they, I'm about to say yeah. it. She has a particular range. Yeah. Yeah. She has a particular range that they're definitely making the most out of. So I wouldn't be surprised because if they wrote it or at least rewrote it around what she was yeah. capable of doing as a great singer. 110%. Yeah. Uh, uh, Drew, what are your thoughts on uh, You know, I love this song a lot. I think growing up, it's like, you know, she kind of lost me as a character. I feel like I didn't really like relate to her because they kind of quite like clearly turn the screws over like uh, mm-hmm. on Janet very like you know if you take this as an extension of Rocky Horror like you know she's been through a lot she's been through like a very traumatic experience mm-hmm. and it's sort of uh you can sort of explain like sort of like touch a touch a touch me and Rocky Horror is sort of a, another kind of showcase for, for this kind of sentiment in this movie we don't know that much about like what's what's wrong with their relationship I mean you get the sense of like vague marital discontent but the lengths that she's immediately willing to like throw Brad under the bus for, like, and just be like, you know, can't do this anymore. Bye. Uh, kind of threw me for a loop when I was growing up or like when I, when I was seeing this and watching it again, it kind of finds it a little bit alienating. So while the music's good, 
I give this like you know like a, a four out of five for me. Okay. But I'm not a big ballad head. So yeah. I kind of it, watching this back to back with Rocky Horror. This does have kind of a little bit of continuity because remember they both did have sex with Frank. So yeah. it could, it could still be she's like okay you're not the person I thought you were. That kind of, that's what I've always... Yeah, there's yeah. sort of like a, you know, uh, emasculated a loose content, energy. Uh, unless you, unless, the, I mean, that's the only continuity mm. I can really think of with this. Um, Bib, interesting. What are your thoughts on uh, In My Own Life? Well, you know, it's interesting. When I think about shock treatment, you know, I think about Rocky Horror, and mm -hmm. that movie was very much using the tropes of sci-fi and horror to look at sort of the psychosexual repressed dynamics mm -hmm. of conservative America. And I feel as though shock treatment... In its music, maybe not so much the conception as the reality TV thing, but in its music, it seems to be more interested in exploring the repression of conservative America in a more Douglas Sirk or soap opera kind of way. And I feel that what we're seeing here with this song is Janet, it, it is very honest and it isn't flattering. It is actually a really sad, bitter song in which she admits that, yeah, Brad, I love you, but I just can't deal with you having feelings anymore. And ultimately what this song is, is justifying her committing Brad in the, much of the same way that husbands used to commit their wives to in the yeah. mental institutions for quote unquote hysteria. Mm -hmm. And here, I think this is one of the more subversive things about the story is that here it's happening to the man. And oh, that's yeah, something yeah, that yeah, whenever yeah. they explore it, it's kind of interesting and, 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 I, I kind of wish they focused on that a little bit more in terms of like how we're sort of upending the expected dynamic here. But this song is a great justification for that. And it's harsh and it's it not kind and it's sad for Brad. It's sad for her too, but it's I, for her, it's sad that she has fallen so far and right. treating the relationship, which is supposed to be a partnership so selfishly. And it sets up right away that, yeah, I love you in my own way, but that's just an excuse she's telling herself. And ultimately she, once she has an opportunity in the soundtrack and in the movie to become independent again and to pursue a career in vapid sensationalism, she throws herself right into it. Brad means nothing to her, really. And that's that's depressing, but I still think it's a great song. Yeah, I think it's sort of almost like, a, I would say the difference between what happens to her in Phantom versus what happens to her in this is sort of the difference between that uh, like the old uh, Exo Jane column, It Happened to Me, mm -hmm. where it's like, yeah, in, in, mm -hmm. in Phantom of Paradise, these things of the fame and celebrity, it's happening to her. Whereas in this movie, she is like actively seeking it out. She's taking active steps to become it and to 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 run toward yeah. that as a as a means to dumping brad i think that's exactly right and i think is that 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 critique of it as it is it being like a male inversion of what happened with like repressed housewives in the 50s and like locking them up i think that's exactly on point and that's probably exactly what he was trying to say yeah. with this it's just like so jarring to see it uh done with a gender swap I also completely yeah. also agreed with you drew that this <sighs> is very dark and it, it is a ballad and i feel like I didn't get as much from it as I did from something to me in, in, in Phantom. And I felt like maybe it's not as rocking as I wish it was. It's not a bad song whatsoever, but it's also not a download. If I, for me, it's a shuffle. Um, I just, mm -hmm. I, it's just not a song that I would really gravitate towards looking back mm -hmm. at this kick-ass soundtrack as a whole. We'll get to a couple of goodies as well. Uh, oh. Mark, Mark, uh, what, what do you give it? I know you love it. In my own way, uh, I'm giving it a five. I feel mm -hmm. like it would be like right at home on like a, a pretenders album. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm. Uh, Bibbs. That's a good point. I'm also giving it a five. Uh, again, it's a bit of a downer as a song, but it's a very earnest song. It is a very uh, um, bittersweet song. And I think that more than any other song on the soundtrack, it is Jessica Harper's real showcase. And if you have an opportunity to showcase Jessica Harper's singing voice, you do it yeah. because she's incredible. And I've always been a fan. So this is, even if maybe you might want to give it like a few points less, for being a downer, I have to bring it right back up again just because Jessica Harper racks it. Oh, she, she uh, voice is phenomenal. Such good, that's such a good point, yeah. Vince. You're making such good points here. I, you, I, make I was about to you make me kind of want to bring it up a little bit because of her voice. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Yeah. I, I have it on, I think I have it on the same place you do, uh, Chris. I have it like on a, on a shuffle Yeah. because like it's just not a, it's not a, it's not a pretty it's song. A solid, it's not the kind it of could be a solid song. download on a good day. Um, yeah, it's going to be a solid download. Yeah. Um, I, I, I thank God I'm a man that works. A man should call the toss. Wear the pants and 
should be the boss. Um, uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I don't really like this song. The, the lyrics are not are kind of really kind of mm -hmm. disturbing to listen to by itself, especially if you're gonna put it in a. Uh, uh, Bibbs, what are your thoughts on "Thank God I'm a Man"? Maybe you have. Okay, so yeah. No, I, I I totally agree with you, but I also I, I have I complicated feelings about this song because I agree with you. But it's also a villain song. I know. Yeah. And much in the same way that like when Scar sings about how he's going to create a Nazi lion hyena regime yeah. or oh, yeah. when uh, uh, Minister or, or when Minister Frollo uh, says that he's going to either take Esmeralda for his own or send her to hell. Like, I don't agree with anything that he's saying, but to hear the inner thoughts of a bad person is mm -hmm. this purview yeah. of musicals. Oh, in a yes. way that few other things can. And so this is a song from Janet's dad, who is upset uh, that Brad is behaving in an emasculated fashion. And he sees mental health problems as something emasculating. And that is, of course, a bad thing to do. And I think the, the, the movie and the soundtrack quite rightly criticize that. I don't think the song is supposed to be shocking. However... Mm -hmm. When you're listening to it in a soundtrack like this, yeah. without the context of the narrative, it just it's all the more shocking. And I do think that drops it down a little bit. It is weird, though, because the song is obviously supposed to be very critical of right. a very conservative, closed minded mindset. And then, you know, you look at like Richard O'Brien, uh, a musician whose work I have respected for many, many years. And some of the things he said uh, uh, in more recent yeah. years have not been as enlightened as I would have hoped. Oh, no. And, uh, it's, it's, and it's, it's, not, it's not, it's not as it's, 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 it's been a little turfy. I'll just say that, but, oh, no. um, oh, God, really it's like a bit, dis it's, it's disappointing, but it's just the sort of thing where like, you know, with the more context you have, like it gets a little better in context of the story and then it gets a little worse oh, in context. Of other things. Nowadays. So, but in, yeah. Yeah, especially now. Well, it should have always been that yeah, way, but especially yeah. nowadays, yeah. I suppose. And, yeah. and so this song for me, it's a troubling song. It's a problematic song. It's a song that makes sense in its context. It's a song that's obviously supposed to be cynical and uh, uh, exposing cruelty uh, in the hearts of the heartland. Uh, but it is also kind of hard to listen to. And sometimes in some lyrics, genuinely hard to listen to. Uh, so I totally get it. Uh, it's, for me, it's not a total wash because I appreciate it in context of the story it's telling. But you're right. It's a troubling song. It's it's yeah. uh, but my argument against that uh, the comparison to, to yeah. Hellfire or another really catchy like be prepared is that it kind of has a, an element of it's not that like Hellfire yeah that that it's probably the strongest comparison to this but at least with Hellfire at least it felt like uh I don't know it didn't feel as though it was. It, again, this has the F word in it. So, I mean, it's just... Well, yeah, it, it, yeah. it does. It has yeah. it has the worst F word yeah. in it, and that's terrible. Yeah. And it's and it's an anthem. And yeah. it's an anthem, which is more propagandistic. Yeah. Which is more dangerous, I feel. Yeah. Uh, so I totally see everything that you're saying. And this definitely is probably the worst song in the soundtrack. Yeah. Well, did you think that the, the people watching this, though, I mean, for what it was at the time, for what it was in the 80s, yes, I mean, I can see where we're at today. Of course, it's gonna. Yeah. there's going to be some... Yeah. Retrograde ideas, but considering how what what Rocky Horror was pushing, and I don't know Richard O'Brien's personal uh, gender or sexuality preferences, but just kind of going in blind, I would think that this you're right. This is a villain song, and this is not supposed to be. Uh, in, I love Be Prepared. I love singing Be Prepared. I can't sing this song, but I do understand what Chris is saying. This is supposed. I mean, uh, what Bits is saying. This is like a, yeah. this is the bad guy song. Oh, I totally. But those yeah. are generally yeah. better box. Mm -hmm. So just on, just on the face of like what this song is, it's it's not that great of a. It's an anthem, but it's mm -hmm. not that great of an yeah. anthem. Like, it's never something you're going to find yeah. yourself coming, I don't think. Uh, Mark. I'm... No, and you should never do this in karaoke. Uh, never, never. Uh, Mark, <laughs> yeah, well, well, I, know, I know that we were talking about it, but what, what are your thoughts on it? I, well, you know, yes, there's plenty about this that is, you know, troubling, and I think that is all intentional. And I feel like it is serving the same purpose that uh, Tomorrow Belongs to Me does in Cabaret, you know, that it's it's not a pleasant song. It's not something you want to be, you know, caught whistling down the street right. uh, you know, at any time. But I think on the merits of what it is supposed to be doing in the story, which is showing his ass and just nakedly declaring all of the terrible things he believes in, you know, it, it it's honest, and I do feel like if it come if it comes up in the shuffle 
I think a reasonable listener can hear it and get instantaneously that this is not meant to be an advocacy song. That okay. that so uh, so I like you know I can dislike what what is is contained in it, but I think in terms of its effectiveness in getting the the, the story thread across and conveying what's in a character's black heart, then I feel I feel like on those merits I have to give it a four. Okay. It's so funny this here, here, how here, I think about sense. this song. It's like I don't I don't hear this I don't hear the I don't hear the melody of the song is all in my mind. What it's replaced mm. with, like funnily enough, is that song from Greece too, where the guy is trying to coerce uh, the the chick into having sex with him by yeah. the bomb shelter's already been bombed out. So it's like just do it for your country. Like which is another kind of like yeah. Um, is advocating a really bad thing by like somebody who's mm-hmm. just a really just a bad person <laughs> trying to do something awful. But like uh, that yeah. sounds like more of a bop that my head has completely replaced the sound of this other song with it. Yeah. Well, and, and one might argue that the fact that the song isn't a bop is maybe encouraging you not to sing the song as an anthem mm-hmm. and sort of not to embrace it that way. But here's here's what it boils down to for me. And again, Mark, I agree with you. In context of the story, it serves a function. And I think even the concept in terms of the concept album, it serves a function. But if we're talking about when we're going to listen to this soundtrack, and if you, and again, I'm the kind of person, well, I'll listen to an entire album, even if I don't like the songs. But if we're going to focus on the premise of this, where we're picking what we, what is hard rock and what we leave on shuffle, if it's just a matter of, will this pop up on shuffle while you're driving someone you don't know that well to like, you know, to like, to to, to, to anything, are you going to have to explain this song? Uh, uh, thank you. But like, are you going to have to explain this song? And the song gets a little awkward. So for me, it goes down one from Shuffle. Okay, I would say it's a one-time listen. Okay. Like, so I mean, I mean, it like that. Like, it works within the thing. But like, I would, I don't want, I wouldn't trust anybody who whose musical taste has this rotating around. Yeah. Uh, just like as a shuffled song. It's 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 it's, yeah. it's 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 a problematic piece. But we're going to go into Farley's song, which we get to hear Cliff De Young, who was actually. Uh, the director Jim Sharman's first choice to be Brad. Oh, why aren't they doing tomorrow's new dance steps the way they used to yesterday? I'm not really fond of it. Okay. You know, uh, it's just uh, well, because also I'm not really fond of the character of Farley either, and I don't mean like, oh, I don't like him because he's a villain. I just don't like his character. You know that you know he's oh, what does he do? Uh, he does evil stuff. And why? Uh, Because he's evil. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it's kind of shallow, but this is a soap opera story, so so be it. Um, I know, I, because, you know, I can talk, you know, my my feelings are this way, that whenever I was at screening and, you know, that, you know, when that line is supposed to come up where you're not just looking at a fast food king, pause you're looking at an ace but i always sang before he finished you're not looking at a fast food king you're looking at a waste of space <sighs> is that what they <laughs> said wow yeah that's yeah i feel like farley's character in general should have i mean i get the twist at the end which he, he's twin brother and whatever but it's yeah just, well we'll talk about that yeah, too. yeah i just feel like this probably would have been better i get the whole song yeah yeah that, i think that this is just uh, it's it's a uh, the song itself. I really like Liv De Young's voice, though. So it kind of makes me like I really I his, his voice. voice. His voice is great. Yeah, yeah the, the, and I can't. Yeah, the, you know, ever that technically speaking, everything mm-hmm. about the song, you know, it you know, tell tells the story, pushes the narrative, establishes his character, but it's not an interesting character, yeah, like, and it's just not that interesting a song. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not as harsh on it as Mark is. I do think this is a, a, a great, fun, catchy song, and I think this is a very fun villain song. I agree it's not as illuminating, but I think that's kind of the point, is that there's not a lot to illuminate with this kind of villain, is the idea that his villainy is shallowness. That's what he's selling. That's what he's marketing. Um, And what he is marketing is this bizarre blend of new nostalgia. You know, Mm -hmm. why aren't they doing tomorrow's new dance steps the way they used to yesterday, which is fundamentally a stupid contradiction. And when you look at how, you know, another reality TV king, you know, happened to rise 
to villainous uh, uh, power, you realize that he's doing a lot of the same like platitudes and a lot of the same sort of blase, kind of uninteresting uh, uh, um, celebration of the past, even though what he's really talking about is himself. And what he's really talking about is I'm not just a fast food king. I'm an ace. I'm, I, it's all about me. And there is a song called the me of me, which could have just as easily gone to Farley flavors. So for me, uh, I, I like it more than Mark. I agree. It's not as, you know, rich a song as maybe some of the others on the soundtracks, but it's a catchy song. And I think it does everything it needs to do. Cool. Uh, what do you give it, Bibbs? I'm just going to let you guys give a score after you give me. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it a rockin'. I'm going to give it a rockin'. It's not the hardest rockin' rockin' I've given, but it's it's definitely a rockin' for me. Before I throw it to Drew, uh, Mark, what would you give it? Uh, I, I give it a two. Uh, you know, okay. you, you need it to you. get the story, but you don't need it after that. I'm kind of in the middle. I kind of think it's a good shuffle. I really do think it's a solid. I like his voice. I think even though the music isn't too like grabs you as much as maybe another ear, other ear rooms do. I think it's enjoyable to listen to, and I wouldn't mind it coming up as kind of a filler between two good songs that I like. So it is, it's good to be sandwiched in between them. Uh, Drew, what are your thoughts on it, and what do you read it? It's actually interesting hearing you guys talk about it. I just realized that it's one of the rare soundtracks that has two villain songs back-to-back. Yeah. Uh, you know, you don't get mm. that a lot. Like, you're going to get, like, a, you know, Kill the Beast after Gaston, you know, but it's going to be... It's gonna be a, it's a strange movie that, or it's a strange soundtrack that tries to pair them off right next to each other, and two different kinds of villainy, I guess you could argue. Although, also the same type of villainy, you could argue. But uh, this one is just, yeah, it's it's inoffensive, but uh, it's arguably less interesting to listen to. Okay, what do you give it? Uh, so I would give it probably like uh, I would give it a three. I'd give it a shuffle. I'd like hear it and like be like okay with it, but I'm I'm not actively listening for it. Cool. I'm gonna try this. I'm gonna let's. Uh, we're gonna do two two songs right off the bat, and we're gonna talk about both of them and what we think of both of these tracks. It's Lullaby and Little Black Dress. As you slip, flip, flip into that little black dress. These are these are higher up on my listings, just like in okay. terms of the, the, the letter, the, the sort of bops that they are. Mm-hmm. Like I mean, they, 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 like I see why you pair them off together, but uh, yeah, yeah I mean the. I feel like the rest of the soundtrack, this is why I sort of blew my wad a little bit early. The rest of the soundtrack gets very muddled for me. Okay. Like you could, you could pair these two up, you could pair like the next two up. And I feel like we're kind of like in this territory now where it's where the songs don't advance the plot. They're just, they're just songs that exist in the story. Uh, they, they sort of uh, co- like coincide with the plot, but they just also are just these random songs about being famous or mm-hmm. the consumerism. Uh, so I give them like, I give them both like a solid, Maybe three, three point four. Oh, okay. it's all three cool. to four. It's all cool. Uh, Mark, what are your thoughts on Lullaby and Little Black Dress? Little Black Dress is catchy as hell. Uh, oh, uh, well, I love them both, but I really love uh, Little Black Dress. In mm-hmm. fact, I I would say that's my favorite song of the entire soundtrack. Oh, really? Okay. Wow. Bold choices are being oh, yeah. made. That's, that's, that's an interesting pick. Why Why is Little Black Dress your favorite? Uh, I think I think because it is uh, it is the the you know I I should quantify it like I I don't care for that you know uh, interlude with Barry Humphreys you know in the second verse but in terms of the fact that I think this is the best marriage of uh, Richard O'Brien's clever songwriting but uh, also with just sort of a good simple kicky. Uh, refrain and you know irresistible subject matter and you know that this is you know I think this is the strongest earworm on, on the soundtrack. Oh, okay. Yeah. And what do you, that, think? you know that I, I feel like this like this could have been a single if they if they had made a, a push and you know lullaby. Uh, you know, not quite as strong as a little black dress, but. You know, it, it feel it feels like uh, the kind of uh, you know, slithery sex song that you'd 
see on MTV like after midnight when they were playing some of the racier videos. Mm-hmm. I, I actually you know, or, or, or it looked for something that would have been in one of those uh, it, it, it sounds like a song that should be in one of those 80s erotic thrillers where someone lives in a glass penthouse with uh, you know a big you know a pool outside and a j- Uh, Mark, oh, I think he, I think I think he was just censored. I think he was about to tell us some very steamy stuff <laughs> about what was happening in those erotic thrillers, and so he was censored. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, you, you said, yeah. Where did he lose him? Oh, when uh, he started talking at the front of the show. Uh, no, you, you said something about. <laughs> You got to the jacuzzi, and then it, and then it just got too steamy for the internet, and we had to we had to get you out. Can you hear okay, ba- ba- basic, basically, lullaby sounds like the theme song to a dubbed Italian softcore drama on Showtime After Hours. Oh, what do you Good give job. It? <laughs> what, nice. do you give, what do you give it, Mark? Uh, lullaby, I give a four. Little Black Dress, I give a five. Perfection. Oh. Uh, I bit. don't give it a six. I can't give it a six because of the Barry Humphreys verse, but otherwise... Hmm. Uh, Bibbs, what are your hmm. thoughts on them both? Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, it's interesting that you lump these two together. Uh, I think it's just because they both begin with an L. Uh, but uh, for for me, Lullaby, uh, uh, Lullaby is a fun song. It's got a very different vibe than the rest of the the, the rest of the, the the album is very manic, and this song is actually very chill. It is a lullaby. Kind of comes out of nowhere, and yeah. you realize when you're watching it, or even when you're listening to the soundtrack, that you could lift this out entirely, and you'd never know it was gone. Uh, yeah. But I do like the song a lot. It's got a lot of weird lyrics. Uh, the 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 verse uh, drift into the treacle deep, slipped into its silent depths, with your everything akimbo, float into the Sandman's limbo. I love that whole verse. That's so weird. Um, so I like that one a lot. I'm gonna give that a download it. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, when it comes to Little Black Dress, I think the reason why a lot of people respond to Little Black Dress so much is because it's maybe the one song on the on the Shock Treatment soundtrack that feels like it could have been like directly taken from Rocky Horror. Yes, mm. like Frank could have sung this song, and you would it would be a perfectly good song in Rocky Horror. It would be like him playing dress up with Janet or something, and it would have been fine. Um, so I so that's fine, but it's also another one that to me feels just a little disposable here. It works because it's Janet getting a makeover, and she's got that great line in the movie. I just came, I just showed stop by to tell you how fabulous I am. <laughs> um, but yeah, for me, it's like it's it's not the best in the soundtrack. I will give it a hard rocking because it hard rocks. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's not my favorite. Okay, but you're giving it a six out of five. That's that's still. I'm, st- that's... I, no, I'm, I'm giving it a five out. I'm giving it a five out of six. I'm sorry. It's a it, it's rocking. Oh, okay, you said but hard it rocks rock. in a hard way. Oh, okay. But I, like, it, oh, okay. It's, it's like it's like two thumbs way up. This is like a, a medium thumb way up. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's like a, it's it's rocking. It's only rocking, um, but it's only rocking in as hard a way as it possibly can without being hard rocking. Yeah, you guys kind of gotcha. nailed the head. I, I think Little Black Dress is again very catchy, not dissimilar to Bitchin' in the Kitchen. It has that kind of earworm kind of vibe mm-hmm. to it. Lullaby, I honestly. As as Bibbs actually said, it, it, you could lift this out and it just wouldn't have any had any effect on the soundtrack. Or even I think the movie itself, I kind of it's kind of on the forgettable side to me. I did give it a shuffle just because it does have little Nell in it. I do dig the the kind of ensemble stuff that it, it is. I think you could you could potentially play this to your kid or whatever, and they could maybe fall asleep to it at some in some capacity, uh, even though it's kind of upbeat for that. But you know. It, I, 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 I kind of dig what he, they were trying to go with it, but we're going to go into Me of Me. Deep in the heart of me, I love every part of me. All I can see in me is danger and ecstasy. Of me is an interesting song because on one hand it's Janet's empowerment ballad. Yeah, it is. It's her like sort of claiming what she wants, telling you who she is, but it's subverting that and turning what should be 
a powerful song about a woman's individuality and her sort of self-actualization into a villain song. Mm -hmm. And that's very strange to listen to. And uh, it's a song that I feel maybe outstays its welcome a little bit. I feel like it make like maybe some of the other songs I'm happy to go with them while they're just making their point over and over again, because there's so much fun here. It's a little repetitive and I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight it too much. Um, but uh, again, I think Jessica Harper is really impressive oh, she is. with how she makes this song her own. But I think the song itself is not the most um, enjoyable to listen to on the soundtrack. So for me, I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it a shuffle. I gave it a mm-hmm. shuffle too, just because you kind of nailed it. It kind of, you know, I I kind of was a little over Janet's kind of attitude the last kind of portion of this movie where she kind of turns into kind of a completely different person that even mm-hmm. i'm used to from rocky horror i get that she i, I again i'm I, my head canon is that it's just all psychological from what happened with frank <laughs> so i i kind of agree with bibs 110 percent. but mark what are your thoughts on me of me well, um, I, I have to, uh, up front, I have a big problem with any song that keeps repeating the word me to make a point. Like that, that <laughs> horrible Megadeth song where, hello, me, meet the real me. <laughs> and like, oh, oh, it's going to be one of those songs. Uh, so, yeah, so I have an instant bias against the this song because it's just oh, hammering the me, 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 me thing. Um that being said, uh, it, it, in terms of it being a villain song for Janet, I think it is, you know, it does its job. It's effective. So I, I don't give it a total, you know, thrashing. You know, I, I give it a three in terms of let, letting it play through. I just feel like it's uh, too clever by half. I got gotcha. you. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. So I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad I'm not alone here. So like, I just I find it like really grating to listen to, but I, okay. I didn't want to come out super strong against it, uh, uh, no. like that. But yeah, it's super grating. Uh, I just it's, it's it's just one of these obnoxious songs that like you know it's not quite an earworm, like it's not quite yeah. there, but it's just it's getting it caught. It's effective in what it's trying to do, which is like make you hate her. But it's uh <laughs> it's not like my favorite song to listen to. It had the potential. Oh, it, it's, to like, it's the Seinfeld principle of you know, hearing a commercial jingle and hating it and then one day you're in the shower singing bye men and it had the yeah, potential exactly. yeah. it had potential because I thought they were going to go into something like I make you a man at the beginning but no it didn't uh, we're going to go though into the title track you need to be the Ooh, I love Shock Freeman I, it's really funny Mark sent us this trailer that he made yeah. uh earlier and it was it used a different version of shock treatment than i think i've ever heard and it's not it's definitely not the one from the uh from the movie but i really like that one too because it was almost like a uh it's like a unplugged version of this song which it's it's really good in the stage in the form that we find it in in the movie like it's it's a great bop and it's a great song but i almost liked it more as a uh, an unplugged acoustic scent or like a, a slower down song but no this is a great song it's a great bop uh it works on its own. Like you can, you can just listen to it and it just stands alone as a, you know, clever song. I just, it's a, it's a bop. The drums roll. Love the the, the yeah. drums roll. I like how boom, 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 boom. It kind of sounds like yeah. an old Western mixed with a rock kind of pop kind of like new wave <laughs> kind of thing. It's, it's, <laughs> it, musically it's all over the place and i dig it and i of course uh the ensemble from rocky horror all sings it it's it sounds again like a rocky horror song and it's just it's yeah great. and you get the sense that somebody wrote this wall in front of television like yeah. watching me you know it's sort of that schizophrenic feeling of what television is or was mm. is 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 that switching through channels and getting these different vibes and getting these different momentums and having them merge into like this yeah. one like soft like consophony sort of sound mm-hmm yeah um mark awesome. she mentioned your trailer uh describe what you, the trailer she's talking about and why you made it and b she did mention a different version of shock treatment that okay yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll cover all of that yeah. um i'll do uh, the last part first which is uh that in the original 35 millimeter prints of shock treatment after the credits are over there is exit music with black screen and that alternate version of shock treatment plays you know it's so it's supposed to be like you know like if you went to see a road show musical that there'd be the lights would come up but they would be playing music to get you out and then the mpaa card would come up now over 
oh, no. move along the way, and some people would just chop off the exit music. And if you buy the current DVD of Shock Treatment, they've removed the exit music, you know, much to my annoyance. I think maybe, I think the UK uh, Arrow Blu-ray did restore it, but, you know, that's for the UK. They haven't done anything for America yet. So, so that's where the alternate mix comes from. It was not included on the soundtrack album. It was, I think, a, like a B-side of a 45. And if you got the Rhino Records uh, Rocky Horror Anniversary CD yeah. box that had, like, it had the participation album, it had the soundtrack album, it had the stage album. There was, like, a disc of ephemera, and that was on it. The trailer that I made, which is on YouTube, it's from 2012. It was when I was assistant manager at the New Art in West L.A. And uh, the the resident Rocky cast there, Sins of the Flesh, were doing a midnight show of shock treatment. And at that time, I had a working version of Windows Movie Maker that mm. crapped out a year later. So that's why I haven't made any more videos since. But I wanted to make a trailer to promote it and... The, the theatrical trailer is fine, but it never really did a great job of selling the movie. And I thought, well, let's sell the reality. So I made all of these reality TV puns in terms of the characters in the movie to show just how much it predicted uh, the, the current environment. Plus, I tweaked some of the taglines that, again, I thought they did that they they whiffed the first time. Like the the tag of the original release had a picture of Richard O'Brien saying, trust me, I'm a doctor when the, the tag should be trust them. They're on TV. And I really thought that was the tagline for the movie, like when, when you put it in the trailer. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I was, you know, I, I always like to tweak things and, you know, not just copy what someone else did. But <laughs> because also uh, the the tag for Rocky Horror was a different set of Jaws. And so for this trailer, I wrote, they give you a different set of television. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you give Shock Treatment, though, Mark, before I throw it to Bibbs? Oh, the song, the song itself, either version, I give it a five. Yeah. I, I just I love that. It, get, it gets it gets me pumped. It I can. I can sing along to it, and it, it, it gets it gets me in a mood. Uh, uh, I uh, today I do kind of hate Chris because he's only letting me pick five hard rockins, so or only pick two hard rockins. Yeah. When there's at least like five, I would put on the soundtrack, and I cannot give this one a hard rockin because I have to reserve it for like my other favorite song. No, but I want to. I want to because this right here is the breakaway pop hit. This right here is the um, uh, the time warp. Yeah. of shock treatment yeah. it's uh, okay. catchy mm -hmm. it's fun you don't need context to understand it it's just a delight yeah it's a real treat of a, of a musical number um it's one of the few musical numbers in this movie that i think is actually staged really well um it's not like in complicatedly staged but it's just it fits and so I, I whether it's in the context of the movie or out, I think Shock Treatment is a hell of a bob and I love it to pieces. And I'm only giving it a rockin' because Chris won't let me give it a hard rockin'. Uh <laughs> it, I it gets a really strong Chris. Yeah, I know. I know. You want I know, I know. Like, oh, <laughs> they hate each other. No, I love you, man. No, no, no. Uh, but, I love you, man. Yeah, I love you too. Man. Uh but uh what I do wanna say though is the one thing that I will knock shock treatment for is just how it ends. It just ends with like the rolling of the beat and then it just stops. It kind of feels like it should like come back or it just kind of ends abruptly. At least the, the, the soundtrack version does. Um, well, I don't mind that. I like mind, that. Yeah, it, it kind of has that why should I worry <sighs> kind of feel to it. Like you need to end it right. But you know what? That's a minor nitpick. It's a rockin'. It's it's hands down one of the best on the soundtrack. And I love how it, it's also uh, Bert's sunglasses get crushed. Everybody's just cir circling around. And I love Charles Gray's like um, reaction to everything as he's looking down upon it. So anything, anything mm -hmm. which way but lose this song is great. Now, guys, um, uh, before I continue, Drew, you gave your rating for that, right? Uh, well, it's a five for me. Okay. Like, it's not a hot five for me. It would have been a six, but, you know, like I, like I said, I blew it early on, on Denton and Fish in the Kitchen, which I stand by. Yeah. I stand by that completely. But this would this would be the other one that I would grapple with playing on that, you know, you know, six out of five list. Totally get that. Uh, what I'm, I'm going to do, though, guys, is I'm going to group another two together. And I think this one has even hmm. more right to kind of do it because Carte Blanche, there's not really a lot to discuss with Carte Blanche. But Walking f for Trade... Essentially, They're looking for trade. Looking, looking for trade comes off as kind of like an arrhythmics kind of vibe to it. It really 
like yeah. It feels like oh, it, it, it feels like another Chrissy High number. Yeah, yeah. It, it feels like she's about to sing "Sweet Dreams Are Made of This" or something. Uh, but I'm gonna throw it to you, Bibbs, since you were the last one to talk last time. I'm gonna give you the first one to talk this time. Carte Blanche and looking for Trey. Carte Blanche is basically an yeah. instrumental until the last minute. But what are your thoughts on these two songs? <laughs> Uh, carte blanche is the, the song itself is a minute and 24 seconds. It's barely a song. Yeah. Uh, in the movie, it's actually mostly in the background until like the last, like two lyrics. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I, and I think the fact that the lyrics to the song are so simple and chintzy and cute and jokey, uh, just sort of apply to that. So for me, uh, carte blanche, uh, it's a shuffle. It's an amusing song to run into, uh, on your iPod, but it's not like a great song in and of itself, and it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be background noise. Yeah, um, looking for trade, I, I just cannot even remember what song Carte Blanche is. Like, which which one? Carte Blanche is like an avalanche of kind okay. of snowballs and that's a free. It, it, it's, where the, 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 it's where the kids are down below when she's talking to them. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So if you're looking for an answer from which you can aspire, then maybe look at me. Like that's how it ends. Yeah. Um, but the actual lead up to it is all in the background. Yeah. Um, so carte blanche, it's a little disposable, but it's cute and it's fun. Um, looking for trade is great. It's another song where if you're listening to the soundtrack, I feel it takes on a very different narrative purpose than it does in the movie because yeah. It's about how Brad is looking for love and partnership and companionship. And she is looking for trade. And you can picture in your head her like sleeping with a lot of people or or maybe even in a red light district, like just looking to pick up someone for money. Like that's where she is right now in terms of what she wants from another person. Mm -hmm. Whereas Brad is screaming that he actually needs like support. And uh, it's another very bitter, you know, hurtful song in a lot of ways, but it's a killer song and I like it a lot. And so I'm all, I'm going to give it a rocket. I actually have the same exact scores as you two, rocking and then shuffling yeah. because again, uh, Carte Blanche is there, made for the musical, made, 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 made. It's it's necessary in the film. It, it would look good on shuffle. It's not bad music. Again, it actually had in my notes here. The the riff sounds like time warp. It, it mm -hmm. really had it has that kind of time warp kind of riff. To, uh, another song we'll get to has that as well. But yeah, uh, for me it's shuffle it and and rocking because I love the lighting of of. Uh, looking for trade and just her her psychosis and what she's going through uh so and I, I again it feels like an arithmetic song and i dig that as well let's well let's get carte blanche out of the way yep. i hate it one skip it okay. uh <laughs> love it. You know, the, the you know the the, the faux hillbilly twangy boy sound carte land hard finds i was like Okay, did I did somebody like you know, intrude on my tape and you know put in something else? Is this the run out groove from Sergeant Pepper? You know what the fuck is it? <laughs> so, less said the better. Uh, looking for trade, uh, another you know, again. It, you know, as you said, I think of it as a pretender's song, or you know, just you know, kind of a you know a a very slinky sort of. Uh, tune and you know going to uh, the refrain we've had about whether this is a sequel or not and whether you know janet is having residual thoughts about her experience with frank to me this is not a sequel this is an alternate universe uh, story and it's getting across the fact that even under completely different circumstances janet would have had this unfulfilled lust that would not have been satiated in a sure. traditional uh, heterosexual coupling and that would need exploration. So this is like the even darker version of touch a touch a touch me. That's right. Because it's mm. a vision. I like that. A lot of a lot of the characters too pop up. You see that through the door. Yes, yeah, uh, hundred. Yeah, I like that a lot. That's yeah. really smart. Yeah. Whatever that scene happened. Uh, my person, my favorite callback was you know that when you say I've come to the day, where it is it, and I just wanted to do. I'm Babe Ruth. I'm going to hit a home run for you, kid. <laughs> yeah. If this was an alternate universe, I wish then more that Meatloaf was in this film. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, Drew, what are your thoughts on, on these? I mean, uh, the first one, uh, as, uh, as completely obvious by now, is, is totally forgettable to me. Like, it's, it's kind of just like a twangy background noise. Um, looking for trade, I always read it a little differently. Like, I, mm -hmm. I read this as way more of like a anthem bop. 
mm-hmm. than uh than her earlier song because this one i mean yes there's a way to read it that uh that you know as opposed to love she is looking for this almost like whorish dynamic but i also think of it as more of a transactional dynamic which is something that i think is you get across yeah if you take this as a parallel universe which i guess i always also have because it's mm-hmm. just it, it's like it's sort of almost like the problem with lovecraft show where there's no connective tissue between week to week episodes I mean, that's a different critique altogether, but, like, it feels like there's not enough connected tissue. Either these characters had their memory wiped or they're just not talking about something like that for mm-hmm. repression. But the idea that she's looking for an equal trade of something, that she's looking for a dynamic in which emotional, uh, there's no emotional stakes in which, like, things are not, like, her death, where she's not being asked of <clears throat> in any way, like, and that always really appealed to me. And, like, it's sort of a counter counterculture anthem. Mm-hmm. So I guess... Well, I I think- what, you it, you, what, what you're describing is kind of what uh, Erica Jong wrote about in Fear of Flying as the zipless fuck. <laughs> you know, the yeah. idea of the anonymous encounter with another person where the zippers fall apart like rose petals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What did you give it, uh, Drew, before we move on? I would say, I would say that's, this one's like a solid, I'd say this is a solid four or five for. Oh. That second song. Uh, the first song, I think, just, like, skip it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I totally get that. Uh, we're going to move on, though, to... Okay. Uh, my id. Look what I did... Look what I did to my id. To my id. Oh, look what I did to my id. Uh, this is one of those songs where uh, Richard O'Brien got so impressed with uh, his wordplay that he neglected to consider whether he should do it in the first place. <laughs> that oh. This song... We... This song screams of, oh, we have all of these tertiary characters and we haven't given them anything to do. We have to give them a number and it's just taking up space. It's just an excuse to put all of these secondary characters in one place and say a bunch of, you know, pseudo intellectual bullshit. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's, it's a time waster. I, I, I give it a two. Oh, okay. That, that's sweet. I felt like at least we got to see Ralph Hapshat sing. He was at the beginning of the first film. It was a cameo. We get to see him sing. I guess, I, I guess that's his voice. He sounded better than I thought he was going to. Um, Bibbs. Oh, I could not disagree with Mark Moore. I, um, I do, I do believe, I, I, I do agree that this, the way that the song sort of functions might, you know, seem a little uh, like you don't really need it. It's a fun song. It's a catchy song. It's got a lot of great wordplay. Um, but I disagree that it serves no purpose. I think that um, it's not about just giving these characters a song because from this point on, the story, whether in the soundtrack or the movie, is wrapping up. Yeah, and. All of these tertiary characters, many of whom had their own miniature subplots or perspectives, have now been completely warped. And whatever they previously desired is now being dictated to them by the TV that they watch, including the guy who had the, you know, the hate anthem earlier is now involved in, you know, TV kink. Um, So for me, this is an ending song for them. And I think it's actually valuable for that because it's establishing that in the midst of everything that's happening to Brad and Janet, there is a larger like sort of social uh, illness that is pervasive and is affecting every single character in the narrative. And uh, so I think it does serve a purpose. I do think it's somewhat necessary. I think it's incredibly catchy. I'm giving it a rocket. Yeah, I figured. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Drew, what are your thoughts on I can't believe what I, uh, what I did to my head? This is, you know, this is a personal preference of mine. I like to say in musicals, I really like, the, I really love the work song. Like, and that's to say, like, I love in Phantom of the Opera, like, the notes song. Mm-hmm. Or I love, like, you know, Master mm-hmm. of the House. I love songs that are just about housekeeping. They're like, you know, it's just two <laughs> people talking back and forth really fast or arguing with each other. Like, I like it, uh, you know, in The Greatest Showman, I like the, the song where they're just arguing about, like, you know, the amount of dividends that Zach, you know, that, uh, that uh, one character is going to have over the other. Like, who's going to get the breakdown of the show? Yeah. Like, the other side, that's what the song's called. I really like the, the other side. Uh, so I really like this number because it takes care of a lot of that housekeeping, but I can see that if you're listening to this as a concept album, why this isn't going to work for you. So I, give this I do think, however, I, I, I do think it's worth noting that, you know, there's this mentality that musical numbers mm-hmm. in a musical with a narrative need to push the story forward or need to eliminate something about the characters. Mm-hmm. I do think it's okay as long as it's not in the way. 
as long as it's not distracting you from something that you'd rather be getting to, mm-hmm. I do think it's okay just to have a fun number once in a while. And even if that is how you interpret this, I think the number is fun enough that it gets away with it. I, I, I think that's a fair assessment. I, I agree with you on that. But it, it, it just feel. but everything about this song to me just feels like it was shoehorned in mm-hmm. that you know, the... The interesting perspective you put on it in terms of where all these characters are now in ter- that they they're all succumbing to this mass psychosis and 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 I feel like I'll I'll give I'll yield that but it's it, you know I I just keep hearing Jeff Goldblum's voice in my head saying you got so caught up in whether you could do this you didn't think of whether you should <laughs> I'm just glad they did it. How's that? I, I, That's what it boils down I, I to. Do, I do You're agree. glad they did it. Part of me kind of kind of enjoys. Yes. Yeah. Part of me kind of enjoys the song. Uh, I I gave it a rock and two because it was kind of catchy. I kind of really caught on to it. I I I do, I do see Mark's point. These are characters that honestly I couldn't really care too much about. A lot of them. I mean the the, the even Brad's parents. The, he his dad was there at the beginning for that song that was problematic, but he kind of disappears throughout the entire kind of. Th- he doesn't really. He's not really. He doesn't really make his presence known as much as I wish maybe he could have. And maybe that's also due to the fact that a lot of the story was kind of mismatched and kind of during the production process. But I mean, e- either way, the song itself to me by itself works. Uh, is there anybody I didn't get a score from? Uh, Drew, what was your? I don't score? think. I think you're good. Uh, sorry, is it what my score is for the song? I don't know if you, you said it or not. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I would say this is like a, this is like, well, this is like a four for me. Okay. I mean, I really like this song, but like, it's, it's not like the highest on my list. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, we're gonna, honestly, if this was, if the song after it, I could have paired it with, but I can't. So we're just gonna go through it. This is, uh... Uh, the the boy band the the the, the band's uh, breaking out while Oscar drill and yeah, the bits Oscar drill and the bits uh, this is mm-hmm. the they they basically play this song as Charles Gray's character the I'm gonna just gonna call him the narrator the criminologist mm-hmm. from from the first film because <laughs> he is I feel like he is the same character from the first film uh, he breaks he kind of is I think he is yeah he breaks uh, Brad out of his cell during the the Oscar drill song which. I have in my notes here, one time listen, because it sounds like a lot of noise. Breaking out! I love this song. I really do. And I think this is an interesting song. Um, uh, so obviously this has a different tone than a lot of the other songs on the soundtrack. It's, uh, you know, it's with a with a suburban garage sound. <laughs> uh but uh, what I like about this song is that it's uh, Oscar Drill and the Bits like show up late in the narrative as sort of just these teen punks. And uh, when you look at how the song is sort of coming in late in the game where everyone in the story is succumbing to conservative brainwashing, but the kids are OK and the kids yeah. are singing punk rock songs about coming out of the closet. And they're kind of being like overlooked and just being dismissed as, oh, those cute kids are doing music. But they're actually showing that there is hope for the world in youthful rebellion. And I think that they're confident, uh, uh, hard rocking, even though I'm not allowed to give it a hard rocking because there's still one song I like more than this. Uh, they're, they're, they're confident, rocking hard uh, uh, performance, I think, is like this real indication that things might turn out okay. Maybe not for most of the characters in the story, but just in life. So I really like Breaking Out a lot. I think it's really, really catchy in its own right. I enjoy it. It's a, it's definitely rocking hard. Well, I, to me, it, I, you said it, though, it does kind of sound like they're in a garage jamming, and I just didn't see the yeah. music with the flu line, in my opinion, but uh, it is their own. Uh, hmm. Mark, do you agree with me, or do you agree with Bibbs more? I'm more in line with Bibbs. Uh, okay. I I feel like this is, you know, the, you know, these are the guy. These are the guys who managed to wheedle their way onto a TV show, and they and they know that okay, we've got one chance to do things our way, and they're probably going to pull the plug on our performance halfway through. But damn it, we're going to you know, we're going to shake things up here, and you know, it's I you know, it's not. 
I feel like in terms of both the story and as a standalone song, you know, that it's, you know, it is not my it is not my favorite of uh, the soundtrack, but I mean, it feels like the kind of song I would have been listening to in my own wayward youth at that time. Okay. Mm-hmm. So what would you give it? Oh, I, I, I give it a four. Oh, okay. I'm in a minority. I don't know. Uh, Drew, what are your thoughts? Raiders man song of the uh you know of the group. Uh, kinda, uh, ca- 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 yeah. Yeah, it doesn't sound like juicy fruits, but it's got that sort of that vibe to it. This is sort of us it's it's going on while the main action is happening elsewhere. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, pay attention to it because it's it's got some interesting things to say. I give this like a I give this a four. Okay. I, I don't mind the song at all. I, I'm also getting to the point where I'm just like, I, you know, it's, with this music, with this particular soundtrack, it's more about not minding it than it is about loving it. Because like, there are certain songs that just sort of like grate on my nerves, and then there's other ones that I'm like, I could listen to this. I get you. And then there's, yeah. you know, yeah, the beginning, mm-hmm. I just, it's really phenomenal. Well, Bibbs, I'm going to throw it to you for this one. This is the revelation that Brad apparently had at the other. We lost our mom. We lost our dad. And if I'm losing you, well, that's too bad. Well, the best thing you could ever do is die. Dual Duet is probably, next to Bitch in the Kitchen, my favorite song on the soundtrack. Okay. Um, this was, as I said before, I saw like the last third of this movie over and over again when I was a kid. And I wasn't able to see the whole thing for many, many years just because of quirks of when it was airing on TV. And Dual Duet is the part I fell in love with. Dual Duet is uh, when Brad uh, encounters and discovers that the villain of the piece has been his identical twin the whole time. And they have a song about how much they hate each other, and they're very verbose and fun about it. You're a dead end, deadbeat, nowhere mister with a kisser like a Mississippi alligator's sister is one of my favorite lyrics of anything, like any song. It's just perfection to me. Um, I I feel like there aren't enough like songs and musicals in which the hero and the villain get to have this kind of back and forth. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I and, and really both because usually they each get a song. Like I wanted to see them both go at it, mm-hmm. and it's here they do that in a really wonderful way. It's like the Late Miss Revelation mm-hmm. song, where it's like you got Javert yeah. and and, yeah. and 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 uh, John Valjean yeah. just. Simultaneously singing yeah. over each other. I wish the more music. I, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but every time it does, it's great. And here, it's really, really great, and it's so much fun. And Clifton Young gets to play both parts, and he's doing so really well. And you get to see just how, like, sort of like cool and not cool as in suave, but cool as in like low key and and earnest. Uh, his version of Brad is, and how abrasive and almost hair metal uh, his his Farley is. And they play off each other so great that actually when I was a kid, I didn't realize they were two different guys. Not because they didn't look alike, because obviously they do, but because he just plays them so different and he sings them so different. And I love this song. This song gets my other hard rocking. Oh, interesting. That's so interesting. I didn't think about it like this. You're like revising mm-hmm. my opinion on it. Oh, well, That's very interesting. What, what, what's your opinion on it, Drew? Well, my, my first one was just a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a chintzy song. Like it's a little bit, mm-hmm. it's like a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a, it's a little Betty Davis for me. It's a little bit of a, <laughs> like, like it's a little bit of a drama queen. It's a little bit soap opera But yeah, I could see like, you know, growing up with it, if, I, if this had been the first one that I'd seen instead of Bitch in the Kitchen, how would I feel about it? I probably would have loved it. Uh, I'm not sure if I would have realized that they were the same person if I'd just been listening to the soundtrack. That's good, though. Which I always love in musicals, like when I can't tell that someone's made a sort of swap, a character swap. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, I think, yeah, I want to revise it. I would, I, I probably want to put it on my shuffle again, just so I can. I'm gonna like go and listen to it after this and see if I can hear that part of it, watch that part of it. Yeah, do uh, as as uh, you don't get that with uh, the 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 main character and the villain kind of sparring all vocally. Uh, the only mm-hmm. other instance, and they cut it, was in my in my recollection is Nightmare Before Christmas. There used to be a duet version of Oogie Boogie's song that he would do that they were going to mm. do during that final sequence <clears throat> on the uh, carousel thing before he gets killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a recording of that it's it's for phenom- I wish that more villains and heroes kind of had that duel kind of thing like they did here because it is really well done and stated. Uh, Mark, what are your thoughts on duet, duet, dual duet? Um, so I can accept, well, I, I, I can accept the notion of Brad and Farley being, uh, long separated twins as part of 
the soap opera structure of the story and of adding, you know, extra melodrama to the, the, the proceedings and to make a, a, a TV-esque story about people obsessed with TV. But at the end of the day, I just don't really like Farley Flavors as a villain. I know that maybe on a meta level, it's it's clever that he should be so shallow a villain and have like nothing going for him aside from just his appetite. But he's still boring. And thus, this song to me is again just Richard O'Brien coming up with a bunch of lever couplets for each other. And it's just like, oh, you're a dick. Oh, you're a bigger dick. Oh, you're a bigger dick. And it's just Ah, oh, I, I, it's just like it. One of those songs where just get it over with. I, I, I've, I, I give it a two. All right, mm. Mark. Can I just can I just maybe throw out one thing that I didn't mention that I'm, I'm curious your take on it because I'm I don't know this, if this affects it or if you consider this and you just don't think it works. But um, you say you don't like Farley's a villain. I totally get that. I can't fight you on that. I get why it's perfectly reasonable. I just happen to disagree. Uh, but when it comes to Brad, on the other hand, Brad has spent this entire narrative. Um, in an institution being told that he's mad for having feelings. And here is finally the moment in the film in which he actually stands up for himself. He stands up to himself in a way and actually stands up to the whole insidious idea that he should feel bad about himself for not being part of a consumer dynamic, for not being part of this uh, sort of soap opera infused suburban repressed lifestyle. And he actually just says, he expresses his anger and he expresses his power in a way that he never had got to before. Uh, does that not affect the, the song to you? Does that not make it a little bit stronger or do you think it just doesn't do it well? Uh, well, I guess because all through the movie, I have, I have never sensed that anger bubbling up within Brad that may, and well, yeah, maybe in the song. Partly, well, maybe partly it's the movie's fault for you know shuffling him off to Denton Vale. Sucks. Yeah, that's what we always told every time <laughs> the card came on screen. Uh, but that you know, once he's in the institution, he's I never really see him kind of get me the fuck out of here. He's yeah, I mean, maybe it's because they've got got him medicated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it just feels. That okay, I can I can accept that in turn on the page. That okay, this is his moment where he's finally going to give voice to everything, all the shit he's had to put up with. But it just never feels. It, 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 I just didn't feel it, and even with you know, the you know the, the and the twin brother revelation, you know, like my. Fr- my my when they when if he first finds out that he's got a twin brother, it, it's like that. Joke. Uh, I I I've heard varying versions of it, but it always ends with, and then the man says, "Wow, a talking dog." You know, <laughs> it's yeah. He wouldn't he first be blown away by the fact of, wait, I had a brother all this time, and and but instead of you know, trying to reckon with all of this past that he's lost, he's already got enough presence of mind to just start you know roasting him without really knowing anything about him because he's. Because before he even knew Farley Flavors existed, he's been shunted off to Denton Vale. You know, so how would he know all of yeah, these? Yeah, he doesn't know that he doesn't Farley Flavors yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I agree the narrative is wonky, and I would love to have seen whatever the original vision for this was, because it's my understanding even Richard O'Brien isn't happy with the way that they structured yeah. the story around the songs. So I agree with you, but here's my thing is in the in the soundtrack, I don't think we've really lost all that because it's not really as focused on the plot. Right, right, right. So for me, th- this is Farley. This is not right. This is uh, Brad finally having his own song. This is him finally having his own way. So in a soundtrack, I think it's stronger than that. But I do agree with most, if not all, of your points. Uh, I just happen to like the way it's handled a little bit better. I don't think any of us are going to disagree that this movie has a lot of narrative flaws. And I feel like, yeah, I mean, more than that. Yeah, yeah. We, we love this movie yeah. in spite of it. 
applause. Oh, yeah. so Sometimes the, even because of, because yeah. it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, uh, what's the word? It's like a scavenger hunt. You have to find yeah. the good movie and the bad one. Yeah. Uh, it's in here somewhere. I know it. If I just put these pieces together, it's good. I know it. It's it's the big and at least you tried yeah. cake. <laughs> my, my understanding is that Richard O'Brien wrote all these songs for a sequel that didn't pan out, and he just put them into this movie just because a lot of yeah. the main cast didn't want to come back. So the, I guess and there's yeah. a lot of yeah situations like that. But anyhow, anyhow, like that transition. Ah. <laughs> uh, this is the finale. This is the finale, and it's one of the most catchy things I've ever watched ever, especially in film. Uh, especially, I love just watching Charles uh, uh, Ray just dancing. But one part where i'm like revising I'm like wait should i save the hard six for uh for this one because this is this is such a pop and it is so <laughs> great, great to see charles gray you know like he's such a great performer like i really mm-hmm. want to give it up for him like i went and like you know checked out his wikipedia page after watching this movie because i was like oh yeah what happened with him like he's great yeah. uh it's a great bop it's a great song uh it is it's such a nice cherry on like a, what is otherwise a very confusing yes. like narrative sloppy pasta of a of a story so I really, I, I want to give this one a five out of six. Yeah. Five out of yeah, same thing with me. I think also the reprise of the Denton song at the beginning really helped yeah. kind of sandwich yeah, and bring it back and, home. Give it, give it, bring it back home again. This is where it really felt like it was obvious that they should have probably been outside because them going down a corridor with all these people and and and, 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 and striped out. It felt like this should have been them dancing in the streets of Texas. I don't know. At the ending, it, it the ending was kind of a little claustrophobic um, for me, but that has nothing to do with the song itself. Go for it. Bibs. Oh, well, I would just say I kind of like the contrast of that, uh-huh. where at the beginning you get in your head. Again, if you listen to the soundtrack, you're getting a somewhat different narrative than if you watch the yes. movie. At the beginning, you imagine that you're in the streets, you're dancing with the cheerleaders at the football game and everything. And at the end of the movie, they're all in straight jackets. And that's the contrast mm-hmm. is that they've always kind of been there, haven't they? Um but uh, for me, I like this song a lot. This song plays better on the soundtrack than I think it does in the film. And the film, it comes out of nowhere. And it has nothing to do with anything other than it's a chipper song on which to end the movie. But when you're only looking at the songs and the story that the songs are telling, yeah. this is a, a, a story about uh, marital uh, uh, strife. This is a song about a, you know, repressed sexuality. This is a song about uh, uh, really a, a, a marriage that is failing. And here at the end, it is a song about letting go of the anxieties that the characters feel about what they want from sex, even if it's different. And they're just going to be open with each other. And that's where the positive ending comes in is in the solution of where it's kind of like the end of eyes wide shut, where after all of this crap, Tom Cruise went through Nicole Kidman just says, we only need to do one thing. Fuck. Yeah. Because that's what this is all boiled down to is the, our sex life wasn't working. We need to get our sex life in order again. Anyhow, anyhow, it's about getting a sex life in order again. It doesn't play that way in the movie. There's only one thing that I regret about mm-hmm. the difference that I think the movie does better than the soundtrack in this is there's one line from like the narrator right before they leave. And it's the sun never sets on those who ride into it. I love that. I love that lyric. I love that bit. I think it's great. I think it closes out the story really well. Uh, but but uh, yeah, it's it's not in the soundtrack if you just listen to the soundtrack, and that always kind of bug me. Uh, but yeah, this one this one is uh, definitely a rocket. I, I enjoy it a lot. It's it's a treat. Um, it's a lot of fun. hundred oh, percent. Mark, go for it. Finale. Um, well, I would. Well, I want to preface. Uh, we we've talked quite a bit about uh, what the ambition was of the movie versus what they were actually able to do because of the constrictions placed upon them. I had. When I was in uh, high school, I had the bootleg of the movie, you know, the audio of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Someone had pressed it onto like two LPs that you were, it was a 90 minute movie. So you were pretty much able to get the whole thing. And I had a tape of that and I used to listen to it constantly just to memorize all the dialogue. But I remember one time I was listening to it and I fell asleep and the audio of it was in my dream And I dreamed like an alternate version of Rocky that was being staged 
in a theater that was showing Rocky. Mm -hmm. So like, so there were things happening with people, you know, independent of the movie, but the movie audio was playing. And I've always thought if someone was going to redo Rocky, that would be a great concept where you just have the audio of the movie and all of this other action happening in like pantomime. So, so it's like a movie version of a shadow cast. Almost that they're not acting yeah. like not quite acting yeah. out the movie. Although in my dream, I was seeing events from the movie restaged, you know, by different players, but just the idea of mm -hmm. like, if you're hearing the audio of the movie, but you're seeing like a guy macking on a girl at the concession counter and, you know, there's no, mm -hmm. you don't hear their dialogue. You're just, mm -hmm. it's being colored by the audio that you're seeing. So Interesting. the confined nature of shock treatment never bothered me because it felt kind of like the, what my dream was that the, this mm -hmm. idea of, being in this confined environment and acting out this play within a play so that, and you know, take, you know, cause the audience that is watching the event ultimately becomes subsumed mm -hmm. into it. And you know, giving into, you know, the, the quackery that the McKinley's are, are selling. So I've given you all of this uh, preface to the fact that I, I'm just kind of mediocre on anyhow, anyhow, because it feels like, Oh, it's the end of the movie. We need to have a song here. <laughs> but, like that 100%. I, I appreciate the I appreciate the gravitas that 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 Bibbs brought to it because I hadn't contemplated it in that way, but it, it always just felt like, oh, we need an ending song right here. We need to send the people home now and so and I, I agree. I That's how it plays in the movie. That's totally how it plays in the movie. I totally agree with you there. It's annoying. One hundred and ten percent, Mark. I, I agree. Oh, sorry, Mark. I, I I cut Mark off and I ruined his audio. No, no, no. Uh, Mark, whenever you return. Yeah, Mark. No, no, no. That was actually a perfect uh, ending. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna figure out. How to well, we still that. needed a rating from you, though. Oh uh, yeah, uh, Mark. What's your rating? Yeah. Oh, oh, I gave it a three. I gave it a three. Okay. That's all cool, bud. Yes. Sir. All right, cool guys. So no, I, I, I think I think we've got a lag. A uh, mark? I think it happens. Yeah, I think <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a lag, yeah. It's all cool. Uh well we're almost done anyway. This is the overall ratings, guys. So I'm gonna throw it to each and every one of you. Just give me what you actually think and what you your overall thoughts on the record before we sign out, okay? So, Mark, I'm actually gonna throw it to you. What is your overall ra rating of the, the soundtrack? And what do you think overall how this represented the movie itself? Oh uh, I think uh oh uh overall, even with all of some of my harsher criticisms of certain songs, I will give the entirety of the soundtrack a four. Okay. Yeah, I think okay. that it that if you're listening, like if you're listening to it the way I did, without having seen the film and just listen like a concept album, you can get a, a feel for where the story is going. And there's enough strong individual songs within that make that make it a, a good listen. Cool. And what's your favorite mm -hmm. song and your least favorite song? Uh, my, my, my least favorite, my least favorite song is carte blanche and my most favorite song is little black dress. 110%. Uh, Drew, throw it to you. Same questions. Overall thoughts. You know, it, it's, it, it's hard. I, I would say, you know, after doing a whole podcast, I'm, 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 I'm sort of remark is I'm like at a four. I, I want to give it higher, but like, this is also reminding me that there's just like, there's just a lot of weaker songs on this soundtrack than I would possibly like. I'd give it like so. It's like a it's it's a bumped up three to a four, mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that uh, my like Mark, it's it's carte blanche. And my favorite song though is probably Denton. Yeah, the opening. I just yeah. really love that song. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. I think um this this is a little higher up for me. I kind of. I really enjoyed the soundtrack. I mean, the movie itself is a mess, but the soundtrack, kind of every single song feels like it could be sort of Damocles. It could be Hoppatootie. It has that kind of like rockabilly kind of vibe that I really dug. And again, it's a good triple feature with Phantom of the Paradise and, and Rocky Horror, especially if you add all three of those to a playlist. They all feel like Halloween. It, it's it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's a great kind of vibe that all of them have. 
Okay, uh, so for me, I, again, there's, a, as with any album, there's a little inconsistency here. Obviously, I like most songs better than most of the panel. Yeah. Um, I think that I, Mark has a point that as a concept album, I think this works yeah. pretty damn well. And I think it's better as a concept album when you can just focus on the story and the uh, themes and the characterizations that the music is telling mm -hmm. and not get confused or muddled by the fact that the movie appears to be doing two or three different things as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, some of which are complimentary, some of which are just esoteric, some of which are actually undermining the music. Um, so even though there are some songs that are you know, I'm not as high on, I think altogether this is a hard rocking album. Uh, I love this album. I listen to this album a lot. I really love the personality in it. I love the playfulness of it. I love the subversiveness of it. And I do, again, believe that as an album, as a soundtrack, yes. just by itself... It is a better listen than the Rocky Horror soundtrack, which leads to a better film. And I think that because it's the, the everyone was on the same page and they were able to make the film they wanted to make, Shock Treatment just is best as an album. And so it's a hard rocking album. I love it. Uh, my favorite song is Bitchin' in the Kitchen, but it's got stiff competition. Kind of rhymes. And uh, my least favorite... Uh, it's probably thank God I'm a man, but even that serves its purpose, doesn't it? So I I, I can only be so mad at it. Yeah, yeah my least favorite is thank God I, I, I'm a man, but my favorite again, it, again I love, it's, I kind of like anyhow anyhow. I like how it ends. I really do. Um, mm. and also bitching in the kitchen is up there as well. So, uh, guys from Bibian William Bibiani from Mark Edward Hoyk and from Video Drew, uh, I'm gonna go through and we're gonna just uh, do some promo. Uh. Mark, where can the good people find you online? Uh, well, uh, get your DTV. Um, <laughs> they, uh, you can find me on Twitter at the underscore H-O-Y-K, uh, the phonetic pronunciation of my name. Um, uh, I'm going to be, uh, there's going to be the big uh, Schmodown free-for-all uh, uh, horror-themed coming up very soon. And... Uh, uh, I'm currently not writing for them because the theater is closed, but you can look up some of my uh, earlier essays at uh, the New Beverly's uh, blog. I uh, Just before or just as uh, the uh, COVID shutdown came, I wrote a massive essay on the trajectory of uh, Django to The Harder They Come to Django Unchained and the common theme wow. between them. It's one of the most ambitious things I've ever written, and I'm very proud of it. Oh, Amazing. congratulations. That's great. Um, that's awesome, Mark. That's really awesome. Uh, congrats. Yeah, um, uh, Drew, where can the good people find you online? I know you have... Uh, you stuff. know, I'm going to keep it real brief. You can find me at everything uh, Video Drew. So I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I also uh, have YouTube and Twitch, uh, all just covered by Video Drew uh, content every day of the week. We do uh, video chronic pop culture quizzes on Mondays and Thursdays at 9 p.m. over on my YouTube channel. Uh, Twitch, we do uh, video karaoke on Friday nights, which is really fun, as long as that's still going on, I think, until January. Um, and, yeah, I do Cinema Bias at 8 p.m. on Tuesdays on YouTube, which is a show where we, me and Alex Macca explore our sort of inherent biases against certain films that we might have missed and have guests on to discuss our blind spots, and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Interesting. Cool. Uh, Bibbs, where can the people find you? I do so much, Chris. Yeah, you do. Chris, I do so many things. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So let's just, let's just get it out of the way. Uh, so currently, uh, you can find almost everything I do at the Critically Acclaimed Network. Uh, there's the free podcast feed, and you can find that on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever fine podcasts are podcasted. Uh, there are multiple uh, regular podcasts on there, including Critically Acclaimed, where we review new movies. We've got Mail, where we answer fan mail. Uh Cancel Too Soon, where we review TV shows that lasted only one season or less. Uh, episode Zero is coming back really soon. And we've been discussing the prehistory of Star Wars, all of the movies that inspired Star Wars, not so much Star Wars itself. Mm -hmm. And in two episodes, when we're done with that, we're going to be switching focus to something that fans of this show might really like. So uh, I don't think we've made that initial announcement yet, but we're going to be changing to the prehistory of another big pop culture phenomenon. Uh, so we got that. We also have... Um, 
uh, a semi-regular show on there uh, called My Dinner with My Dinner with Andre, in which we invite people to watch My Dinner with Andre and have a conversation about it. Mm. Uh, and also we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash critically acclaimed network, where we have a ton of exclusive shows, including not on Disney plus, in which we uh, discuss films and TV that should be on Disney plus, but mysteriously are not this month for Halloween. We're doing tower of terror, mm, yeah, which was a movie based on the on. ride and right. And there's, it's, it's, it's a, you can get it on DVD. It's not on Disney plus. It was the first movie ever based on a Disney ride. We're going to be reviewing that and trying to figure out why it's not on Disney plus. Uh, we have only the best. We review every single film ever nominated for Best Picture. We have Holy Batman, Holy with a W, in which we are reviewing every single episode of the 1960s Batman TV show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, of course, we have uh, All Our Yesterdays, in which we're reviewing every single episode of Star Trek ever filmed in production order. And uh, the most recent episode, as of when we're recording this, uh, we have John the Outlaw Roca on to talk about the Western-themed episode Spectre of the Gun and to tell us about what really happened at the OK Corral. It's a really fun uh, conversation. So I'm also on Twitter at William Bibiani. And, of course, you can see me on the Schmodown. I have a championship match coming up uh, really soon. So fingers crossed for Shazam. Cool, cool. And I would like to also, uh, you guys can find me at Chris Clogger, 8788. Those numbers mean nothing on Twitter and Instagram. But I do want to just make the announcement that our gold tier Patreon uh, person, uh, Brandy Parker, she did request uh, for her $20 tier on the PJ Campbell Network uh, a Suddenly Soundtracks episode, which we're going to be airing tomorrow. Uh, we are going to be doing Cabaret. So make sure to check that out Ooh. tomorrow. It airs. Uh, tomorrow. So, from Mark Edward Hoyk, from Video Drew, and from William the Beast Bibiani, I am Chris Clark, and we say to you, keep rocking.